Ladies and gentlemen, uh, join me to welcome Vivian uh, Onamo as she comes on stage. Vivian, you're welcome. As Vivian is taking uh, her seat, I would love to take this uh, uh, great opportunity to introduce to you our second uh, great speaker this morning. Uh, his name is Shonam. Shonam is from Ghana. He is a renowned technologist, and he's the 2015 Mandela Washington Fellow, but he was also named as the Global Shaper of the World Economic Forum. Uh, but also, uh, Shonam has great achievements uh, when it comes to youth development in Africa, and he is currently serving as the youth advisor, in, uh, an elected member in the Economic, Social, and Cultural Council of the AU. He knows a lot about uh, the 2063 uh, 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 AU agenda on development. But he also owns Telecom, uh, Telecom Visions Limited, and he has spoken in a number of uh, uh, conferences, and he has profound knowledge uh, speaking on education. But he also won a number of accolades. Uh, he, was, uh, he received an award uh, of Africa Top 35 Under 30 CEO's Achievement Award in the year 2014. And he's a young entrepreneur. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me this morning as I welcome the second uh, uh, speaker for our plenary discussion this morning, Mr. Shonam. Shonam, you're welcome on the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Vivian, for uh, joining us uh, this morning. And you'll be our first speaker this morning. And we, as Yale Fellows, we understand that you have been a remarkable speaker in various uh, international conferences. And you have made uh, quite a number of good achievements in inspiring young girls and women in Kenya and the entire Africa. So we want to understand, as we want to transform Africa and East Africa in particular, uh, what would you think would be the role of uh, Yali Fellows in the process of making Africa a great, uh, a, a great continent, in East Africa in particular, on the role of Yali Fellows on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development? You're welcome. All protocols observed, fellow youth leaders, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You have to be energetic. That's how we're going to change the continent. Uh, I'm very excited to be here for the Mandela Washington Fellows East Africa Regional Meeting. Nothing beats starting off your day by interacting with brilliant leaders of the continent. They say we are leaders of tomorrow, but I'd like to add, we are leaders of today and tomorrow. You're already creating waves through the incredible work you're, that you're doing, and that in itself is leadership. And I would like to actually acknowledge the youngest leaders in the room today, Girls on Fire. Can you stand up, please? Thank you. Allow me to start off by thanking IREX, the State Department, and USAID for making it possible to be here today and be a part of this amazing family of doers. It is very exciting and humbling. You're the face of the continent. It's indeed a bright face that is encouraging and inspiring. There are about 2,000 Mandela Washington Fellows across Africa. Wow. This gives me a lot of hope as a young leader knowing that there are many of us who are striving to make a difference. The future of Africa is bright, and it will only continue being bright if the necessary investments in education, empowerment, health, and overall well-being of young people is made a priority. Today, approximately 60% of the total population in Africa is below the age of 35 years. The median age is 19 years. 
Africa is much more youthful today than it has ever been in the history of civilization. Everywhere I travel on the continent, I come across young people who are bubbling with ideas, innovations, and solutions to today's problems. However, young people also struggle with lack of access to education, quality healthcare, unemployment, poverty, violence, among many other issues. We are an asset to our countries. Thus, it's imperative that our voices are heard on these issues and addressed with urgency that it deserves. Two years ago, while leaders convened at the United Nations headquarters in New York to adopt a new development agenda, their sustainable development goals. These 17 ambitious goals are ours as young people. We should own them and be part of the implementation process. I was fortunate to be part of the consultation process that led to the adoption of these goals. And as much as we stress the importance of young people being part of those processes, I think it's even more important right now to be part of the implementation. You learn better by doing. Take your time to dig deeply into these goals and learn about the indicators and how you can localize them. The only way the SDGs are going to become a reality is if we translate them to a language that can locally be understood by many people so that they can effectively play their role. As Mandela, as Mandela Washington Fellows, consider yourselves as SDG ambassadors in your various communities. No pressure. Take ownership and lead fellow young people in conducting small workshops, either at schools or community centers, to educate and inform them on the sustainable development goals. Through our organization, The Seed Project, we have been able to conduct small sessions in some towns in, a youth, in, some towns in Senegal to teach young boys and girls about the global goals. Last year, we hosted a youth event in partnership with UNESCO, and I was thrilled to see five, six, seven-year-olds making the correlation between education and hunger, education and clean water and sanitation, education and peace. Clearly, it shows that they have some understanding on how interconnected the global goals are. And the only reason we managed to be successful with this project is because we simplified the language and used local dialect to get the information out to the kids. Don't be overwhelmed by trying to tackle all the 17 goals at once. Find one or two that resonate with you. Do research on what your government or local community is doing about it. And then figure out where your skills and expertise can be maximized. And if there's nothing that's being done, then go ahead and start it off. Leadership calls for that, taking initiative. But make sure you let people know what you're doing so that they can chime in. It is not going to be easy. A lot of politics is going to play in, and that's why it's important to keep contact with the other fellows so that you can exchange knowledge and experiences. You're very fortunate to be in a room with 14 African countries represented. Imagine the amount of information, expertise, ideas in this room right now. This in itself is a great asset for all of you. Make sure you use it well. Network, network, network. By the time you leave this place, you should have learned something from another fellow leader, and that's a task I'm assigning you. Um, take advantage of the guest speakers, organizers, and facilitators from IREX and USAID and ask as many questions. You have a great opportunity right now Use it to amass as much information. Then use whatever you've learned here to go and shape the development in your community. You are already making it happen, but we cannot afford to be complacent. You have to keep the fire burning in you. You have to keep the momentum if you are to achieve lasting and sustainable change in your community. Start small. It's not about quantity, but quality. A great example is Miss Naomi Maura, a 2015 Mandela Washington Fellow from Kenya, who was offered full-time job with her host, Institute for Transportation and Development Policy Africa, which is a global nonprofit that offers sustainable transport solutions. Naomi, are you here? 
No, actually. At ITDP, Naomi contributed to the Sustainable Urban Mobility for Plan for Kisumu, Kenya, helping to analyze issues around gender and equity. During her practicum, Naomi authored articles on innovation around transportation in Tanzania and Rwanda and was featured in Sustainable Transport magazine. I'm sure there are many Naomi's in here. Keep up the good work. You are all Naomi's. As young leaders, remember to be disruptive. Maximize on new technologies. Be open to new ideas. The sustainable development goals won't be achieved if we continue with business as usual. Learn to question processes. Document your work. Research on new models of tackling the issues at hand and hold leaders accountable. As I had initially stated, these are our goals. And we need to play a major role in making sure that our governments allocate the necessary resources to tackle them. Let's be advocates of accountability and transparency. Let us embrace our diversity as Africans and use it as an asset to nourish and develop our communities. This conference provides a great platform to network, learn, and forge synergies. It is only through partnerships and collaborations that we can get the work done. And as young Africans, let's work together towards achieving an equitable, inclusive, productive, and sustainable Africa. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Vivian, for such a remarkable uh, speech regarding what would be the role of Ayali Fellows on Sustainable Development Goals. But again, I want to invite uh, my friend Shonam to uh, kindly tell us about uh, uh, at least two uh, different things. Uh, because I understand you have a profound knowledge and background on the agenda, AU's Agenda 2063, but also the Sustainable Development Goals, but also the SDG, uh, the SDGs are 17, but, uh, but the uh, AU's Agenda 2063, uh, there are seven aspirations. So how can Yali Fellows align uh, uh, the 2016, uh, 2063 AU's Agenda with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Please proceed. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, officials of FIREX and uh, USAID, uh, all other protocols observed, uh, I really want to begin by thanking you sincerely for, for inviting me. I'm truly humbled for the opportunity to speak to these high-level uh, caliber of fellows. I've taken some time to look at the profile of the fellows, and I realize that they are highly placed uh, individuals. So I'd like to begin by asking if you have any of the fellows who had had the fellowship from Clark Atlanta University. Please clap for them. <laughs> <laughs> so you realize that even though we are fellows, some fellows are more equal than, than the others. So, yeah, I think they've always come across as the best uh, fellows we've known so far. Uh, so I, uh, my topic essentially is to speak to the African Union Agenda 2063, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. But I think that a little background will help. So in 1963, a group of leaders, uh, independent African state leaders led by Kwame Nkrumah, gathered to form the Organization of African Unity. But the whole idea for that organization was to have political, to achieve political independence. And fortunately, that has been achieved. So on the eve of the 50th anniversary, they came together again as leaders of Africa, now about 54 countries, to now form what we call the African Union. Now, the main agenda for the African Union is to have economic emancipation, because at least we've achieved the political independence. So to be able to have this economic emancipation, they decided that it was important to have a vision that guides our path for the next 50 years. So that essentially is the foundation 
of the Agenda 2063. Now, there's, for the first time, there's something different. The truth is we've had several programs and policies over the years that seeks to guide the African Union. So, so for example, NEPAD, I'm sure you heard of NEPAD. You know, you know there's uh, Abuja Treaty, there's Lagos Plan of Action. So all these various documents were put together and reviewed. Also, something new had happened. What they've done also is to consult all the stakeholders across the continent, including youth, women, you know, non-profit organizations, you know, state actors, etc., to be able to arrive at what they have decided and what is now called the Agenda 2063. For this agenda, we have seven aspirations uh, from the consultation. So really, this is not leaders who have gathered in a room uh, and just come out with aspirations, but these are what the people of Africa uh, uh, want. So probably with your permission, I'd like to read some of them. A prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, an integrated continent, politically united, based on the ideas of Pan-Africanism and the vision of Africa Renaissance, an African of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law, a peaceful and secure Africa, an Africa with strong cultural identity, common heritage, shared values, and ethics, an Africa where whose development is people-driven, relying on the potential of African people, especially each women and youth, and caring for children, and finally, an Africa as a strong, united, and influential global player and partner. So in a nutshell, Agenda 2033 is a strategic framework for the socio-economic transformation of the continent over the next 50 years. It builds on and seeks to accelerate the implementation of past and existing continental initiatives for growth and sustainable development. So you'd have realized that this is really well comprehensive. But something new also happened when they were designing the Agenda 2033. What had happened was that they came out with specific deliverable projects, which is supposed to occasion the, the turnaround of the growth of the continent. The, the leaders had agreed on fast track programs and initiatives. Number one, we're going to have an integrated high speed train network throughout the continent. It will be from Cape to Cairo. And, and I'm happy to announce that this project has actually started. We're going to have an African commodity strategy, a continental free trade area, Pan-African e-network, African passport and full movement of people. And last year during the African Union summit in Kigali, the, the African president had been issued the African passports. And very soon, all of us, including you and I, will have the African passport. What it means is that if you have an African passport, the idea is for you to be able to travel to every part of Africa without having to go through that hassle we all go through every day. Now we have another ambitious program of silencing the guns, you know, and then also of the Grand Inder Dam project. So this project, it's essentially going to be based in Democratic Republic of Congo. And when it is completed, Africa is going to generate about 39,000 megawatts of energy to power the entire continent. And if, and if this happens, it will remain the biggest installed capacity throughout the world. And the, the leaders believe that to be able to develop, you need energy as a foundation to create infrastructure. Then there's also a plan to have annual economic forum. Uh, it essentially started, I think, uh, last two months. African leaders, including business people and all key stakeholders, gathered in Mauritius. The whole idea is to begin to have to chart the path of Africa and, and bring in other stakeholders like business people who most times feel removed from action, also be part of the entire conversation of the African development. We also plan to have a single air transport network and also an African outer space strategy and then Pan-African Virtual University. So for the Pan-African Virtual University, it's already happening. 
uh, a lot of, I know of a 2014 fellow who is actually a graduate of, of the Pan-African University program. The whole idea is that some selected universities on the continent are, are giving the opportunity to host Africans to study in Africa in different programs, science, technology, engineering. I encourage all of you, especially those who are interested, to just go on the, on the website, the AU website, and then you can apply to be, to be part of it. Then there's also a plan to have a well-coordinated continental financial institution. So the, we're going to have African Central Bank, and Nigeria is, going to, Nigeria is going to host that, and it's supposed to have taken off from 2018 next year. And so you can see that the, 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 the leaders of the continent are really ambitious and really want these things to, to happen. Now, if you look at Agenda 2023, the main thing that we want to achieve at the end of the day is to have improved living standards among the people of Africa, transformed inclusive and sustainable economies, integrated Africa, empowered women, youth, and children, a well-governed, peaceful, and cultural-centered African in a global context. So you would have realized by now, after my sister spoke, she spoke extensively about the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. You'd have seen that there's a significant uh, unity between the two programs. On the eve of the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the UN wrote later to all stakeholders asking for ideas about the future of the world. So AU, as a key stakeholder, wrote to the United Nations about how we want the world to be. And I'm happy to announce that a lot of the things that AU wrote now represent the, United, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so if you look at it very carefully, and you look at Agenda 2063, you see that we're speaking about the same thing. What is high on that agenda is to be able to eradicate poverty in all its forms. And these two programs speak volumes uh, about that. But there's other thing about hunger. Of course, poverty and hunger uh, you know, speak from the same uh, 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 language. Now, what is also key is the transformational nature of these two programs. You, you, see that the, you see that poverty remains the biggest challenge in our part of the world. The idea is that if we're able to eradicate poverty, we'll, we'll be making significant frog leave on the development of the continent. And so what AU, what AU has done is to tailor-made these development program to suit the need of our continent. We are fully aware of the challenges of the continent, of conflicts, of hunger, of poverty. And our vision is purposely to be able to achieve, achieve that. Now, that's, uh, that's part of the conversation which speaks about the role of the young person, or better still, the role of the Mandela Washington Fellow in, in getting involved in these things. I've heard many times about how far removed African Union is from the people, and how, they are, how many are unable to get involved. The truth is, these are continental programs and policies. AU is a policy organization. When the policies are done, the idea is to have the different countries to internalize these policies. Now, every country would have its own programs and vision. So if we, have, if we take Agenda 2023, what we're expecting Kenya to do is for the Kenyan government to incorporate it into their local plan. How I see us getting involved is to be able to engage directly with our government and see how we can participate in rolling these things out. But what is also very important is the fact that whatever we're doing now, be it entrepreneurship, civil society, or government, in one way or the other, we're helping to achieve 
the, the vision. What I want you to know is that you need to be able to take the leadership. You cannot expect that African Union would directly get involved in having this thing achieved at the grassroots. So that is why you and I remain the main ambassadors and the main agents of development in our rural communities. I have taken a lot of notice about the work of several fellows. I know of a lady called Regina Jari. She, she does a program where she trained young girls in coding. So as I speak, she's trained over millions of young girls globally. She's a 2040 Mandela Washington Fellow, just helping them to code. The truth is there are very few female programmers globally. And what she's doing is to have a lot of these young girls become giants in technology. And for me, this is extremely significant uh, work in achieving the, the Agenda 2023. For any vision document to be realized, it will take leadership. That explains why the most successful visions we've seen in history, like Lee Kuan Yew's Singapore, it revolves around leadership. And so it is only when you and I decide to take the leadership that we are able to achieve a lot for, for our countries. I would like to stop at this moment and then we can take the conversation. Thank you very much. Great. Hello, uh, good morning. My name is Arnaud Gahimbari from Burundi. And uh, this topic is quite interesting for me because uh, I work for for uh, the East African community, which is a regional economic bloc. And um, you talked about how the African Union came into place. And one of the reasons it also came into place was when they formulated the uh, African Union organization, their objective was to look at Africa as one context and then after independence, grow economically. But it was failed completely. And then they thought about the regional economic blocs. And now, currently in Africa, we have eight of them, and uh, growing considerably. So now, in line with the um, Sustainable Development Goals of the uh, United Nations, but also the Agenda 26, uh, 2063 of the African Union, of the Africa we want. Now my question is, how relevant do you think the regional integration is? Because most people can't see the relevance of it, because they look at powerful countries joining with less powerful and think that the ones which are less powerful or less fortunate, like I call it, are taking advantage of the big ones, which in the end makes the integration agenda useless. So I don't know whether my point was taken. Uh, thank you, Arnud, for thank your you. good question. And I think when you, when you uh, ask your question, please introduce yourself so that we can take a note. Yeah. You at the back. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, we, we, you, you have said uh, the next step is economic uh, independence. So my question, because I, I in, in, conver in con conversation with, with other African fellows, the, what I see is that there is kind of uh, two interpretation of this economic independence. The first one is isolation or making Africa uh, uh, separated from the other part of the world whereby we'll trade among each other, we'll do everything among ourselves and somehow protect, pro protecting our economic opportunities and everything reserved for Africa. Or is that about being uh, competent, being innovative and being uh, able to compete in the global market? So which direction are we taking? The second one is about uh, political independence. Yes, political independence somehow is achieved, but internally, unless we have uh, democracy, uh, can we achieve the economic goal, you know, every other goal that we have? How important is uh, political freedom in countries? Thank you. Thank you. 
we, we, we take three questions, then you will respond. Yeah, the last question? Yeah, okay. There. No, no, no. Yeah, there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tanamo, I wanted to ask about the train from, Cairo, from Cape to Cairo. You said that that d design, that project has already been implemented. And if you can just say a little bit more in terms of implementation, does that mean that the trains are, are ready to go or it's still in design stages? You got that question? You didn't get it? Can you uh, do it again? Uh, Snamo talked about the train from Cape to Cairo mm -hmm. and, and making it easier for Africans to go, go beyond borders by train. And he said that he's happy that that project is, has been implemented, has started, correct? And, and so I just wanted to ask, by starting, does that mean that the trains are ready to go from Cape to Cairo and we can now start making our, our bookings, or is it still a project that's in design? Okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, Shonam and Vivian, you can respond. You can respond to those questions. In. Thank you very much for the question. So I think the first question essentially wanted to know much about integrations, whether we're going to be able to integrate as, as a continent. Yeah. So the good news is that the, the Agenda 2063 uh, envisaged that very significantly. The whole idea is to have United States for Africa by 2063. So that's what we're working towards. The, it it, it sounds quite ambitious, given the too many uh, diversities on the continent. However, you know that uh, every major program must begin with a step. The first step is to have the, to minimize the barriers in, in assessing different countries within the continent. So that, that explains why we have the, the African passports and then the, the free continental free trade area. The belief is that over time we can continue to integrate so that by 2063 we would achieve full integration. On the issue of the train, the, high, the integrated high-speed train network, the project actually started. Um, uh, so what happens is different countries, it, it, it's a huge program, so every country who is part of the program would have to internalize the plan. But the idea is that by 2023, which is 10 years from the time their vision was created, we should be able to achieve that. So work is already happening. I am unable to tell you, give you specifics as to where exactly we are now, but I'm fully aware that work has started uh, on that regard. So when I say work, I mean from the, because the plan has happened long ago, I'm talking about design and implementation. Thank you. Um, just to add on, I think Tonama's pretty much handled the questions well. But when it comes to the re relevance of regional integration, I think it's very important for Africa to have one voice, more so when we stand on the global stage, because that's where we are taking advantage of. We sometimes look very divided as a continent, and uh, that uh, takes away our negotiating power and also our strong voice when it comes to the decision-making tables on the, global, on the global space. But also, when you talk about the Agenda 2063, the Sustainable Development Goals, as I'd said, these are our goals. And all these plans and structures being put into place, we as young people are the ones going to implement it. So how well equipped are we for the regional integration? How well equipped are we um, to move the agenda forward? And we cannot, if we still talk about xenophobia, I mean, it's... It's Africa, it's a, we are talking about the United States of Africa. And also, the education has to be a Pan-African education. You're in South Africa, but you don't know anything about Kenya, you don't know anything about Ghana, but you know something about the United States. That really defeats the logic of talking about regional integration. So education has a role to play, but also we as young people um, 
how well aware are we about the continent and also these agendas that are being put into place because we have to take ownership. The implementation is up to us. When it comes to economic independence, um, opening the borders is going to be very important. I mean, getting to Nigeria, it's going to cost you more for the visa apply than applying to France or uh, Peri applying to France or the UK. And that makes it difficult because we have to open the borders so that we can exchange knowledge and ideas, um, access to opportunities, trade, and that's how we're going to achieve our economic independence. And also we're going to achieve the one voice that we are talking about as a continent. And also political freedom is very important. <clears throat> and uh, most of the time, we young people are taken advantage of by the politicians. Nobody's going to address our issues, but during the campaigns, Everybody is talking about young people are the future, young people are this, young people are this for the economy, but there's no investment. For we, so yet we as young people, we have to take ourselves seriously and make sure that these politicians actually address our issues. And political freedom is going to be very important. I mean, I was just talking to Fusa and he was telling me about the story in Tanzania where they were just arrested for speaking out and holding the government accountable. It's frustrating. But that's the reality. But that should not deter us. Actually, it should encourage us to keep pushing and holding these leaders accountable. And also investing in young people. Yes, we are the future of the continent. If you're not educated, if you don't have access to quality health care, if you don't have decent jobs, then how are we the future of this continent? So investment in young people is very, very important if the continent is actually going to achieve economic independence. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your responses, but I want to get some more clarifications from you. Uh, because you, when you look at the agenda, the uh, African Union's Agenda 263, it is very ambitious, but also Africa has infant democracies. In, 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 all, at least ha, uh, more than half of the African countries, there are more than 10 listed uh, dictators in Africa. We have just uh, we, re recently in DRC, Congo, uh, the, 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 the sitting president was supposed to be uh, going out and he didn't go out and things of the like. And the vision of these African leaders, they want integrated continent, but also politically united. So if African countries at individual capacities are not united, are not politically united, how can uh, this vision uh, of being politically united be achieved? How? But also, we want to understand on the integrated continent, we want to understand how can people and people participate in uh, citizen-driven uh, initiatives. What is the role of uh, people-centered development uh, in, between the two uh, agenda? Because we have like uh, 13 years to make sure that we achieve the sustainable development goals. And we have 50 years to make sure that we achieve the agenda 20. Uh, so wh what is your response? What, what, what's your take about that? Um, what, was the last what was the first question? Um, first of all, the good example is here. Mandela Washington Fellows. In this room, we have 14 different African countries re represented. So we as young people, let's build the momentum on the ground. Let's show our leaders how to do it. And you're already doing it. So let's just be more vocal. Let's tell the stories. Because we're the ones who are going to lead the continent. Yes, we have the dictators and we have all these leaders in position of power. But we are the ones who are electing them and putting them in those positions of power. So if we stand, if we, if we build strong movements, if we have one voice, if we stay informed, then we're going to have the right leaders in position of power. So... I think when it comes to that, it's up to us as young leaders. And Mandela Washington Fellows is a very good example for that. Yes, thank you. So, no, yes, people-centered development. So the whole idea really is us. I mean, the, the, the development of the future is really about our actions and inactions today. Now, there's a role, the role of the politicians or the political leadership cannot be taken away. What I propose is that we work with them at the same time, focus more on what we can do to contributing 
to the development. I'll give you a classic example. Back at home in Ghana, I chair at the Association of Ghana Industries, which is the voice of the, the industry, the businesses in Ghana. I chair for Accra. So I've been rooting for a concept where we should have industries or companies in every district in the country. So during the political season, all, you know, all candidates will come around and, and talking to us. And I will co consistently make these points. I'm happy to, to announce that the, the newly elected president had just adopted this program, so now is the priority for him. So the one district, one factory policy becomes the main masterpiece of this, of this government. And I'm saying that it's possible using the tools we have. Using the advocacy tools we have, it, it's very possible. Also, what is important is for us ourselves to take the initiatives. This program is divided into three sectors. The, the entrepreneurship group, I suggest very strongly, should really be looking more into a Greek. Because part of the thing is food security. And food security, to achieve food security, is to produce, is to farm. You know. And the land space is huge in Africa. A lot of fertile land. The weather is good. What is left is the leadership. Because if you have land, you have cheap labor. Is the entrepreneur what is, what, which is needed. And you and I, the entrepreneurs, you and I is the one that have gone through this process to have been selected as leaders. You know, so let's begin to do uh, the, the programs. Well, thank you so much. I just took two questions from gentlemen. I'll, I'll be taking one last question from a lady. So, ladies, where are you? Uh, okay. There. Valerian. Thank you. Uh, I think I'd like to, um, to question Sonam, but Vivian can also have a point on that. Um, in terms of co coordination between policies and strategies, we, because you are representative of ECOSOC today, and uh, you talked about NEPAD, and we all know about CADEP. They're asking our government to, uh, to invest 10% of the budget uh, in agriculture. While in the meantime, they're asking them to invest 40% in, in, in health. While in the meantime, they're asking them to invest 30% in education. And we end up having more than 100% invest in something. So I'm just questioning you as youth. When, whenever they are planning all these strategies and how our government should invest in different sectors, where all of them are, let's say now being honest, that they are priority for Africa, but we should be realistic in terms of how, uh, how we can invest in those sectors and how we prioritize them in order to have uh, relevant uh, results and, uh, of course, being result-oriented in our objectives. So how did you guys, as youth, um, advocate in different uh, platforms that you are invited in? Uh, neither whether it's uh, uh, African Union, Union or ECOSOC or United Nations, how do you advocate so that they can be at least um, realistic in this um, uh, way of stressing our government to invest in different sectors? Thank you. Thank you. There is a call for one more question for, from a lady. Where is she? Okay, there. Hi, everyone. My name is Pauline, and I have a question for Vivian. What are, what are some of the advices you can give to young leaders like us? Thank you. OK, I think, uh, Vivian, you can start to respond to the questions. OK, um, thank you so much for the question. <laughs> um, my advice to you is to take education seriously. Um, education is your voice, it's your power, and uh, it's going to give you the credibility. I am here today because of the education, and I'm grateful to, for the people that invested in my education throughout. Education has given me the exposure, but has also given me the opportunity 
to advocate for the 62 million girls who are out of school today. And you're fortunate to be in school today. So take your education seriously and make the best out of it and create a difference for other young girls in the community. And by creating a difference, you can mentor other girls, you can volunteer in your community, use the power of your voice. There's a lot of power in your voice and you have to know that. Even as a young person, you have a lot of power to make a difference, but it starts with your education. Thank you. Okay, thank you. But to add a statement to that, so for me, the biggest voice is action, really. Just create, and then everybody will look for you. Make it happen. You know, so that action-driven approach has always proven to be the best in my view. Now, back to your concern, my friend. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, she has concern about different budgetary allocations. So, all these decisions about what goes where, are decisions taken at a level called specialized technical committees. So typically, the AU will bring together the sector ministers. So if it's a Greek, all our Greek ministers of the continent will meet. So when they meet, they have very long conversation after different level of consultants would have presented their reports. And then they will decide that we're going to dedicate, say, a 10% of our budgetary allocation to agriculture. At that stage, you realize that they would have been fully informed about the realities in their different, different countries. So that's how that process happens. Typically, how we participate as young people is to go back to these different ministries in our countries. Because if you go to the Greek ministry in your country, I can assure you that there are 1,001 initiatives and programs that allows you to assess a facility in one way or the other to support your initiatives. And so really, what is lacking is the information gap because we are not aware. But I'm just saying, just make the next step. Go to their website. No, I'm sorry, most of them have a great website. I mean, it's <laughs> most, most of the websites are not updated for several years now, most of them. But just walk into the ministry, ask about the programs they have, and you'll be so amazed how you can get a lot of support in different areas. Uh, thank you so much. As we are coming to an end of our plenary discussion, I would love you to use like uh, six, uh, 30 seconds to uh, tell us what would uh, 2016 YAL Fellows take post this conference back at home. Uh, only three words in, three, uh, in, in 30 seconds. We are starting with Vivian. All I can tell is be proactive, be determined, use the power of your voice. Everything you, should, you do should revolve around entrepreneurship, which will be based on two things, impact and innovation. Thank you. Well, Yali Fellows, uh, please. I think uh, th uh, those clubs are not enough for the great uh, discussion we had with these uh, two wonderful speakers. Will you please uh, put your hands uh, together uh, again for Shonam and Vivian. Well, we thank you so much for taking part in this uh, wonderful plenary discussion on the Agenda 2030 on Transforming East Africa. Thank you so much for, for, for the...